Hi, and welcome. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Kathy Healy with PTSE's Tra Next Steps Transition Training Program. We're here at VCU, our RTC, in partnership, funded by a grant from the U.S. Department of Education Rehabilitation Services Administration. Um, we have dedicated a series of webinars to topics related to transition for secondary students with disabilities and families. PTSE has been around for about 30 years. We're the Virginia Parent Training and Information Center. We field inquiries from families and professionals um, from all around the state, and we invite your questions as well. We can help you with uh, topics related to special education and general education, and generally how to cultivate uh, a good support system for your young person with a disability. You can reach us by phone um, in, co in the Commonwealth for parents, 800-869-6782, or locally at 703-923-0010. We invite you to visit our website, www.pizzi.org, where you will find information about the other webinar topics in this series. We're offering CEUs and CRCs to professionals, and for parents, we will issue a parent certificate of training to you as well. Um, today, we hope that you will enjoy the presentation and that you will, at the end of it, fill out a short evaluation. And if you would like to participate in a web, uh, a web board discussion with the presenter, we invite you to stay tuned for that as well. Um, you know, in Virginia and in other states across the nation, uh, when students reach the age of majority, um, they must be apprised of their rights as adults. And so many school districts are talking to families now about gaining guardianship for their young people. Um, which we believe it may be the right thing for some families, but it may not be the best choice for all of our young people. And today we wanted to have a kind of thoughtful discussion about the things that a family should consider before they entertain a full guardianship for a young person with a disability. Um, it was very sad to us um, recently when we heard from um, a parent who had taken guardianship for her child to find that the child who wanted to vote in one of the national elections was barred from voting because she had lost her right to vote which is what the guardianship had done. Um, this mother, this parent was really upset about that and didn't know what she was doing when she had signed on for guardianship. Now, it may be that in this young person's case, it might be the appropriate step, but there are, are lots of options and parents and, and family members really should know about those options before they launch into this very severe um, and very significant uh, part of a person's life. So we've invited Sue Swenson to come and just share some ideas with us, just, to, just for us all to talk about it in a different way, think about it in an intelligent way, so that we can make the best decision with our loved ones. Sue is the former commissioner for the Administration on Developmental Disabilities under the Clinton administration. She's a former uh, public Policy Kennedy Fellow. She is the former Executive Director of the U.S. ARC, and she's with us today to provide insights. She's an internationally renowned speaker. Um, she's uh, a terrific, intelligent spokesperson. She's a mom, and she's a good friend of mine. And so we are very, very happy to have her here today to help us understand some of these issues and steps that we can take to best support our young persons with disabilities. Please help me in welcoming Sue Swenson. Thank you. Sue? Thank you, Kathy. Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about guardianship and decision support, mostly alternatives to guardianship, other ways to think about it, basically how we think as parents about rights and risks and responsibilities. First, I want to be really clear that I am not a lawyer, okay? Nothing that I'm saying to you today can in any way be construed as legal advice. Uh, I want to point out that there are a lot of informational resources on the web. If you search decision support, 
supported decision making, person centered planning, you'll find a tremendous amount of information. I want to also remind you that other parents are a source of wisdom. I think the best way that we can as parents walk our way through this stuff is have a friend who's somebody we trust, who knows us, who knows our life, and really talk the issues over with them. Maybe our decisions will be different from their decisions, but it's useful to have that opportunity to really think through what are the impacts of what we're thinking about. My email is sue.swenson at gmail.com if um, you need to contact me for any reason. The struggle for rights for people with disabilities has been, as you know, a very long process. I'm not going to go into it in depth. I just want to point out to you that in the last hundred years, essentially, we've gone from a focus on deficit, difference, deviance, to a focus on eugenics and really trying to get rid of people with disabilities, to a focus on institutionalization and segregation, then to normalization and from normalization into an idea of having a program and a plan and readiness. And now we're really working hard on equality and inclusion. And that's the platform that I'm going to be speaking to you today uh, from a platform of equality and, conclusion and inclusion. What can we do to ensure that our sons and daughters enjoy as much equality and as much inclusion as we can possibly manage? Paralleling this change, we see a change in the rights of people with disabilities and what the movement has been. The human rights movement after the Second World War was a significant piece for us. Uh, people with disabilities were horribly abused in the Third Reich and the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights very much went, meant to address that. In the 50s and 60s, we saw the beginnings of the parent movement. In the 60s and 70s, we saw the civil rights movement writ large and most of our disability laws. We have seen a disability movement, uh, particularly with psychiatric survivors and people with other what are called mental disabilities coming out and saying, look, we're, we have a disability, but we're not broken and we don't want to be controlled. And the self-advocacy movement now, it's very important to understand that if your son or daughter has a cognitive or intellectual disability, it's very important to understand that the notion of self-advocacy, of them speaking for themselves, is what we're aiming at at all times. You'll find some statements of rights. If you look on the web, I recommend you look at any of these if you want to just try to figure out what someone's rights are. The Developmental Disabilities Services and Bill of Rights Act really has strong language about what we expect from citizens who have developmental disabilities. Obviously, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Olmstead Supreme Court decision, IDEA has significant language about rights. Um, I'm going to recommend two other kind of odd sources. The Montreal Declaration on the Rights of People with Intellectual Disabilities in Healthcare has a very significant piece on supported decision making that was written under the auspices of the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization. It's quite useful. You can find it online. Um, the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, particularly the section on legal capacity, is a, a really useful one to look at. So as a mom, as a dad, as a brother, as a sister, the thing that we need to think about is whose life is it anyway? When we start out with a son or daughter who's newly diagnosed, sometimes we think that we have a right to treatment or a right to cure. And sometimes we look at school and it says we have a right to a free, appropriate public education. And we're always looking for ways to get over the deficits. And program and program and program is so important in somebody's life. We also think the basic right to safety and security is something that we want for our sons and daughters. We want that for all citizens in our communities and certainly no less for folks who have disabilities. But I want to point you at really the seminal statement of rights, I think, in the disability field, which came from a blind advocate, who's, um, Mr. Tenbrook, who said, as people with disabilities, we have the right to live in the world. And that's what we're trying to work on as families of people with disabilities, is how can you have the rights to proceed in your ordinary life? How do you have enough money in your pocket to buy your own lunch? How do you have the right to have a job? How do you have the right to use public transportation? What are all of these other rights? How do you have a right to control your own life? 
And when we start talking about decision making and guardianship, often this is where we come right to the nub of it. When you think of decisions that we want to be able to support as parents, you got to think of a whole range of decisions. I mean, simple decisions of personal taste. What color is my room painted? Or what color is my clothing? Don't think of these as unimportant. These are decisions that people with significant disabilities for millennia have not been able to make because they have been thought not to have opinions. Now we know people care very much. They care what they wear. They care what color their room is. Some do, some don't. They care, what do I do for fun? How do I spend my time? What music do I listen to? Who do I hang out with? Who do I live with? These are all questions that are, that are personal. Whom do I love? No one, no one can support you in a decision to tell you whether you love someone or not. That's a person with a disability making their own decisions about uh, the things that are most personal and most close to the heart. We get expert input on a whole bunch of other things, whether to have surgery, how to manage our money, whether to marry, not whom to marry. These are questions that we ask for input a lot of times. You know, if I marry, how will it affect my SSI? Really good question and one which it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of expert opinion on. As parents, we worry about a whole bunch of risks. When we're talking about guardianship or supported decision making, often we're talking about trying to reduce people's risks to as close to zero as we can get them. So we worry about, you know this as well as I do, we worry about health status. Somebody's uh, condition is going to cause a different problem or a secondary disability. We worry about someone having an accident or getting injured doing something in their ordinary life, being in a car accident. We worry about abuse and neglect, financial abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. We worry about how people are spoken to. We want to control those things because we love our son or daughter. We don't want them to be hurt. We worry about loneliness and isolation. We worry about what does it mean to be shut away and how do I balance the risk of loneliness versus the risk of maybe being too much in the world and being exposed to all of the other risks that are out there. We worry about violence and even more now we need to worry about crime. We're finally realizing that a lot of the things that we used to call abuse really are crimes and we need to stand up for people with disabilities and make sure they're not victims of crimes. Now, it's easy as a person, as a mom or a dad or a family member of somebody with a disability to say, well, I'm just going to wrap them up in cotton and keep them safe. I'm going to tuck them away someplace in a nice house with nice furniture and make sure that nobody ever hurts them. And good luck with that. That's not how it works with our kids without disabilities, and that's not going to be how it works with our kids with disabilities. Important thing to remember is that overprotection is also dangerous. Robert Persky did some of the earliest and most impactful thinking on the dignity of risk for people with intellectual disabilities. He said, overprotection may appear on the surface to be kind, but it can be really evil. Making decisions is part of life. Getting through your day and learning and choosing and engaging and being part of the world is how we have the right to live in the world. And if we are overprotected, if someone else is making all of our choices for us, we can't do that. Because I'm a mom, before I get into some of the legal models and other ideas, I just want to talk about what I think is the, what drives us most when we're thinking about guardianship or supported decision making or other models. And that is, as parents, we have a strong sense of our duty to love our son or daughter. You know, I often tell young parents, if you can just help your kid understand that you love him or her with her disability, just the way she is, without changing anything, you will have made an enormous contribution. So. Um, I just want to remind you, I don't know if you've ever read A River Runs Through It or seen the movie. It's uh, an amazing story and it has a sentence that 
I think is incredibly important. It says, it is true we can seldom help those closest to us. Either we don't know what part of ourselves to give, or more often than not, the part we have to give is not wanted. We can love completely without complete understanding. I don't have to tell you this. If you're the parent of a person with a disability, you already know that you're loving somebody without necessarily being able to understand what their experience is from their point of view. The more we do that, the stronger it gets, I think, but um, it's not easy to do. The goal as we look at models of decision support is to move from the least restrictive to the most restrictive, to move from temporary kinds of supports to permanent supports, to move from specific supports in specific life areas to plenary supports or supports that affect someone's entire life, and always with the goal of preserving the person's rights. Supported decision making is a phrase that you'll hear from a lot of advocates. Basically, the idea is to use accommodations to support one, someone to decide and communicate. A lot of people are quite able to make decisions. They're just not able to communicate those decisions. So if you think of using a communication device or alternate communication or augmented communication, obviously that's an accommodation. For some folks, like my son Charlie, uh, the accommodation to communicate is really having other people around you who understand the little signals that you put out and can, un can uh, try to read what's in your mind. Um, yeah, it's not perfect. We're still working for ways for him to communicate, but you use what you've got. Um, the idea is that you use more accommodation for more important or difficult decisions, that you allow for choice, so you don't just say, hey, is it okay if we do this? But you explain, these are the options. Here's where you can and cannot make a choice. That you allow for trust. Try to build relationships with the person so that you can tell whether they trust you to make a decision or not, whether they trust you to support them in their decision-making process or not. And to allow for relationships, and that's a plural. Supported decision-making is almost impossible to do if it's just you and your son or daughter. You really need to think about, how do I bring together a circle of support? How do I bring together a person-centered team? Now, I want to point something out to you, because when we talk about decision support, sometimes we think it's something just for people with disabilities. But we all use decision support. Anyone who ever calls an expert like a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant and asks for advice, Anyone who seeks advice from friends or family, you read Dear Abby, or you write a letter to a, an advice columnist. If you seek counsel from wise people, such as clergy members, um, it's all a form of decision support. It's all a form of reaching out to other people and getting advice. Now, classically, the legal wor rule is that only the person who decides can decide whether to take the advice or not. So the point is, you don't want to force advice on someone with a disability. You certainly don't want to say, well, because you have a disability and I don't, my advice is better than uh, whatever your idea is. Often people with disabilities invent wonderful solutions to things that people without disabilities don't even think about. So very important to sit back and listen. So given decision support and given the notion of person-centered planning, the really important question to ask as a parent is, why should people with a, dis with a disability need a guardian just because they can't manage alone? None of us manage alone. So being pushed into having a guardian, having total control, giving up your civil rights and your personal rights and your legal rights just because you can't do it all by yourself seems like a bit of overkill. Person-centered thinking means you have circles of supports, you have shared decision-making, you're open to challenge from other people. With Charlie, we might sit in a team and when he was little, we would sit in a team and let his little brother come forward and say, Mom, I don't think Charlie would like that and here's why. And good advice comes from a lot of places. It came from kids in the neighborhood and 
other folks, um, people that he trusts in his life, people that he liked. Um, it involves having the right support for the right task. So when Charlie interviews uh, people to be his personal assistants, we would just watch him. And he interviews and he'll scoot his chair over and touch somebody that he wants to trust to work in that very highly personal situation of being a personal assistant. And if he doesn't scoot over and touch someone, he may like them, but he just doesn't feel quite comfortable in the, in the highly personal relationship. Well, that's a form of person-centered thinking and uh, supported decision-making. He needs the team. He needs all of us sitting around him noticing who he touches and who he responds to, and we're the ones who translate that, but um, he's the one actually making the decision. We're watching. So trying to understand that, trying to understand how does someone show uh, what they're happy with or what they're interested in is really important. What are the signs of someone being stressed out? These are important signs to know if you don't have verbal communication in place. Be open to questions. Be open to rethinking, well, what, um, you know, are you sure this isn't your own convenience or interest here? Are you sure you don't want him to do this just because it's easier for you? Now, I want to talk about that a little bit because we talk so much about people with disabilities having self-determination. Sometimes we forget that families should have self-determination too. And that just because you have a son or daughter with a disability doesn't mean you give up your life to manage their life. But um, the reality is most of us are doing more than we ever thought we would be doing and for longer periods of time. And your thinking is important. It's an important piece of the mix, being able to just say honestly, well, you're right, that is for my convenience, or it is so that I'm able to keep my job, or um, whatever it is. It, it does involve me, but I'm part of the team, and here's how we come at that decision. And, you know, I'm not writing a plan for my son that is a peel me a grape plan. I'm not writing a plan for him that's going to solve every problem before he even knows he has a problem. And he has to live in the, with the family and with everything else that's going on in the world. And he's not a prince. He, what, he didn't, nobody died and made him king. So he's going to negotiate with the team on what the choices are. And we're going to try to go with what works best. When you're doing person-centered thinking, you're always thinking about the person's strengths and their support needs, their accommodation needs. And you're thinking about the dreams and nightmares of the team, too. This is obviously a process, and it's something that you make your way into over years. When your child is little, you can start asking questions and offering choices early. You can start saying, do you want to wear purple socks or red socks? And trying to watch which one they really want to do. Um, it's never too late to start giving people options. It's never too late. Lots of people with disabilities have spent time learning to be compliant, learning to do what other people want them to do. They haven't learned to speak up and say, here's what I want. If your son or daughter is a teenager and you can get them connected to a self-advocacy group, they will begin to learn those skills. Sometimes they can learn them from you as a parent. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes you need to give people a chance to go out there in the world and try uh, before they can really figure out how to do it themselves. You've got to figure out how to learn to listen. It's not easy and you have to keep reminding yourself, at least in my experience, you have to keep reminding yourself. And you've got to develop your confidence. So you have to feel like when you say, you know, I think when he does that, I think it means that he really likes this. You've got to be confident that you're right about that and it takes a while to get there. You want to also encourage others to participate in the process because you don't want to be in this by yourself. You want to be able to have significant others in your life, neighbors, friends, uh, siblings, your family, your extended family. You want people to be able to step up and say, you know, I think we're overdoing this or I think you might be going a little bit too far down that road. Sometimes those are trusted providers um, 
sometimes it's people in school or staff in organizations, but you can't always expect people in school to tell you what's going to work best for your kid. Because believe me, they're up to their eyeballs trying to figure out what's best for your kid in school. And they may not be thinking about what are the long-term impacts if this family seeks a guardianship order? Uh, what are the long-term impacts if the family tries to take on person-centered planning and do supported decision-making and really try to listen to what's going on with their son or daughter? These are tough things to think through and you need your buddies around you. Some other strategies, and for some of these you're going to need to get a lawyer besides beyond person-centered planning or in addition to person-centered planning you may want to seek power of attorney. Power of attorney is interesting because it can be very specific for purposes such as health care or a particular situation. You need to understand the legal structure of power of attorney is that it is given to you by the person with a disability and they may take it back whenever they wish. So um, setting up situations where you, you go in and review whether they're still comfortable with it, whether they wish to have it taken back. It's a really good way to do it because you end up with some decision-making power that can be recognized by healthcare providers and others um, without needing to seek a guardianship order. A guardianship order, once it's in place, is a court order. And to have it re reversed is a significant process. It can't just be initiated always by the person with a disability. Think about how you use a special needs trust. A special needs trust is a financial arrangement that allows you to appoint a trustee who really acts almost as a guardianship of someone's money. So um, they, make argue, they make decisions about how money is managed and dispersed from someone's account. Very important when you're talking about special needs trusts to have a lawyer because every state's laws are different and one wrong word and you've probably just put their benefits under SSI or Medicaid in jeopardy. So think through where you're going to get advice about a special needs trust. But if you're really worried about managing someone's uh, financial situation, that is probably a much better way to go than a full-fledged guardianship is. Um, you can use a trust to do all kinds of things. You can use it to support person-centered planning. I've heard of trusts where it makes an argument that every year, every other year, the person with a disability will go spend a vacation with their brother in a different state, and on the reverse years, the brother and his family will be funded to come and stay with the person with a disability. That gives everyone a chance to stay in touch, if, even though they live in different states. Um, and it's ongoing, it's a, it's a way of looking at the future that keeps person-centered planning in place and yet it's supported by the trust and managed by the trustee. A trust allows you to fund what's important to you or what you think is important to your son or daughter. So living situation, uh, access to spending money, those kinds of things. Uh, fund what's important to them. And I want to point you at something, um, as far as I know there's only one state in the United States, Washington State, that has a pool trust that's state sponsored. So people in Washington State can uh, create special needs arrangements and have their money managed by the state money managers. And it's really pretty interesting if you want to look at it. I think other states may want to start looking at that. I'm really interested in what happens now in this financial downturn if we're going to see that people who are part of that special needs trust um, have access to better supports than folks who are outside of it. Other strategies to think about that it really is pretty easy to do if your son or daughter has SSI and you're worried about managing their financial situation, uh, set yourself up as a representative payee. It's very easy to be a payee on someone's SSI. It means you have to do the paperwork, you have to do the reporting, and you manage the money and you're responsible for the money. Um, but if money is your big worry, wh what's going to happen if my son or daughter has too much cash? then this is a good way to do it. Electronic banking and technology gives you all kinds of ways to control money that you didn't used to have. So you can have a prepaid debit card where your son or daughter can have access to 10 or $20 at a time. You can download it over the phone and uh, refill the account if they suddenly need more money. 
but meanwhile you don't have to worry if they lose the card or if someone steals it from them. They don't have access to an entire account. This is a really important way to support somebody and give them freedom, give them a little bit of plastic in their wallet without, um, without overdoing it. You don't want to be handing out a dollar at a time to, not to an adult. Use technology to connect and communicate. Use cell phones. Think of the use of cell phones and how we support decisions in this modern age. If we can have a son or daughter who can carry a cell phone or a GPS device or a chip in their wheelchair that opens their front door and locks it behind them, there's a lot of technology like this that helps us avoid risk and keep people safe. Uh, monitoring systems in the house, um, night owl services out of Madison, Wisconsin is one great one. Rest assured out of Indiana is another great one. There's, we're, I think we're going to see a lot of advances in terms of technologies that people can use to stay safe. And use technology to supplement information. So make sure that you know what you need to know. And you can have accounts where your son or daughter has access and so do you. And you use the web to manage that. We have to be thinking more and more in those directions. A new way of thinking about guardianship is that as at one time it was seen as a benign way to protect people with disabilities and it is now seen as an intrusion into a person's basic civil and human rights and a legal process to be avoided. One of the foremost experts on alternatives to guardianship in the United States is Don Hoyle from the Ark of Michigan and Don wrote this in an article um, on alternative, called Alternatives to Guardianship that you can find online uh, with an easy web search. He does workshops all over the country. There are a lot of other people who do too. Uh, lawyers like Stan Hare, who um, Stan did foundational work on what are some of the alternatives, trying to keep track of how other countries and how all of the states in the United States are beginning to create more and more alternatives to guardianship and finding ways to keep people with disabilities from needing to have uh, a guardianship order. It's, it's a very important piece. Remember those first slides where I talked about the changes in our society? And the people who give you advice as a mom or dad are not necessarily people who are completely up to date on what's the new thinking in disability and disability advocacy. So, for example, one of Charlie's teachers at school said, well, of course, you're going to need guardianship orders now that he is you know, 18 years old. And I struggled with that, and I thought about that, and I talked to other people about it, and, you know, I don't need guardianship orders, and we don't have guardianship orders for Charlie. Um, but from her way of thinking, that was the state of the art, and it was the best advice that she could give. What she didn't realize is that if he had a guardianship order in the state we were living in, he couldn't vote. And um, he doesn't vote right now, and I'm still trying to figure out ways to convince myself that uh, I'm not voting for him when I, when I try to read who he's in favor of. But I have a lot of friends whose kids really do vote and really care deeply about it and are deeply knowledgeable about it. And if they had a guardianship order, it would really impede their ability to do that, as well as their ability to enter into contracts of any kind, including marriage contracts. So um, it's really important to think about where do you get the advice from and why someone might be giving you the advice. They think it's good advice. Or someone tells you, well, now that HIPAA is in place, um, health insurance portability, uh, accountability, and um, I can't remember what it's called, <laughs> HIPAA. <laughs> anyway, now that it's in place, should we have guardianship to make sure that our kids can get health care that's proper? Well, I don't have guardianship for Charlie, and he has had a car accident where he broke his ankle and needed to be in the ER, needed to have uh, emergency treatment. There was no need to have a guardianship order. We would have needed a guardianship order to stop his treatment for an emergency. You are not allowed to make medical choices that are abusive. And um, I completely agreed that he needed treatment for his broken ankle. And they completely agreed that since we were his parents and he was on our insurance, that that was fine. And they would go forward and they didn't seek any other kind of advice from us. Uh, another alternative, he had um, 
Charlie had to have his gallbladder taken out suddenly in an emergency. And the same thing. The doctor said, I said, well, I don't, I'm not his guardian. Is that a problem? And they said, no, if you wanted us to try to not take his gallbladder out, we might need you to be a guardian. But uh, no, this is the, the recommended treatment. And it was a pretty involved surgery and pretty dangerous. But um, the only way to move it was to go forward. So think of healthcare in terms of, you know, are you going to be asking for things that are outside of the norm of medical protocols? Then you might want to be thinking about, do I really need to be a guardian? Look, some people still ha are guardians. They feel for some reason that they have to be a guardian. Uh, maybe they already are a guardian. Sometimes there are questions of shared custody or legal status that make guardianship more advisable. Sometimes there's a history of guardianship. Sometimes there's a breakdown of someone's person-centered supports or natural supports. Sometimes there has been no exposure to alternatives. People haven't had a chance to learn, gee, I, there's something else I could do instead of this, and they end up being a guardian. And sometimes they get really strong advice from a legal or a financial advisor that says, you must be the guardian. And they follow through and go through with the guardianship orders. So I want to point out a couple of things. If you are a guardian, these are your duties. Work within state law in the scope of the guardianship order. That's very complex in some places, and sometimes the scope is very limited. So you may have financial guardianship, but you can't make decisions about what kind of living situation someone is in, whether they live in uh, ICFMR or a group home or a gated community or a single apartment. Sometimes your guardianship just doesn't reach as far as you think it, it might reach. If you're a guardian, you have a responsibility to consider the values and preferences of the individual. So you're not allowed to go in and just substitute your decision making for their decision making. You're not allowed to go in and just say, well, gee, I don't like urban environments, so even though they like it, I don't want my son or daughter to live any place where there's a bus route. Um, you're not allowed to do that. If that's where they want to live and that's what they like, then you really need to take that into consideration. You need to, as a guardian, consider the in, and encourage the particip participation of the individual and uh, help him or her regain their legal capacity. Guardianship order is a removal of legal capacity. It is essentially adding legal disability to all of the other disabilities in someone's life. And um, you have a responsibility to try to return that capacity to the person if you are their guardian. Uh, very important to realize that even if you are a guardian, there's a good way to do it and there's a not so good way to do it. Your last responsibility, at least the major one, is to minimize restrictions in their life. You have, a re you have a responsibility to make sure that their life is not controlled by other people any more than it has to be, that they have a chance to make choices in their everyday life, that they have a, cho a chance to have the freedom to live in the world. I put a couple of resources down here. That last bit I gave you was from the National Guardianship Association Standards of Practice, which you can find online. If you want to look at person-centered planning, there are hundreds of articles on the Quality Mall website, which is qualitymall.org. Um, I highly recommend that you look at the little article, Rethinking Guardianship, by Don Hoyle and Kathleen Harris, and The Dignity of Risk by Robert Persky. In addition, I would recommend that you look at the websites of the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. You will find wonderful resources there on the history of the disabilities movement and other alternatives to guardianship uh, kinds of articles. Um, likewise, the National Disability Rights Network, NDRN.org, and also the American, uh, the Association of University Centers on Disability, AUCD. You find a lot of resources there that will help you connect to people in your community and get some help to make the decisions that you have to make so that you can help your son or daughter on an ongoing basis make the decisions that they need to make so that they have the right to live in the world. 
Thanks for your time today, and uh, give me an email if I can do anything for you. Thanks.